Happy Sabbath. It sure is good to be back in Loma Linda after traveling. So Travel much. was great, but it's good to be back right here on the campus. It really is. And part of our values here at the Loma Linda University Church is growing disciples, but that means growing in areas of worship and study. Bible study and prayer. Also community, community and service and yes. service. So we have some different things we'd like to mention in each of those categories. And I think we have quite a few things coming up with worship and programming. Yeah, we're going to start off with worship. So very, uh, right off the bat, we have a Vespers program coming up October 8. It's sponsored by the Association of Adventist Women. You're going to check our website for the information on that. It is followed by a banquet. The Vespers at 5 p.m. is free. The banquet, it is a ticketed event. You'll go to our website so you can register for that. Also in the category of worship, we're starting a brand new sermon series. Um, it's starting next week, October 1. And there's gonna be some se a seminar in the afternoon. Here's Pastor Randy and Jamie Stadola to tell us more about that. I'm really looking forward to our fall sermon series. It's entitled Covenant. It's focused on strengthening our family relationships. We're gonna do some unique things. It'll have a bit of a back to the classroom feel, but important themes and topics for our families. It will be accompanied each Sabbath afternoon by covenant conversations. Jamie, you work with our care and counseling department. What are we looking at for the covenant conversations? Yes, we'll be continuing the conversation uh, regarding the sermon topic of that day. So each week will be a different topic at 4 p.m. here in room 1402. It will vary a little bit in how it's happening. We'll have some presentation, we'll have some conversation, Q&A kind of environment. And we look forward to having you there. The purpose here is to help strengthen our families. Amen. We look forward to you joining us for Covenant and for Covenant Conversations. And then one more special program that's happening next week, October 1st as well, is the Cal Baptist Choir and Orchestra at 5 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. If you haven't heard them, you're not gonna wanna miss them. And those are all that we have currently for worship. And then in the value of study, we have a new Sabbath school that is starting out. Our Sabbath schools are really our small groups as well here at the church. The Sabbath school starts October the 1st. It is called Peacemaker. This is a Sabbath school that is a biblical approach to conflict resolution. It'll be Sabbath mornings at 1030 in our new family ministry building. If you would like to be involved in this Sabbath school, they would actually like for you to fill out a, a form, a registration, so that they can keep it a small group and they also will have some materials that they will be distributing to you. So if that's of interest to you, go to our website and get more information. Next under the category of community, tonight at 7 p.m. at the Redlands Church, it's a combination of the Loma Linda University Church Crosswalk and the Redlands Church. It's fresh picked improv. It's 7 p.m. for a good laugh, our own Scotty Ray is involved and many others. You're not gonna miss it at 7 p.m. at the Redlands Church. Just saying his name made me laugh. <laughs> Scotty Ray is awesome. Hope yes. you guys come out for that. And then if you are looking for ways to serve, one of our, our values here at the church is to give back and to serve. And so next weekend is actually the Quilters, the 25th and the 26th of September. There's a correction, I think on our slide last week, it said October, but it actually is September the 25th and the 26th, that's Sunday, Monday. And that's this weekend, actually. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'm losing it's track tomorrow. of time. Yes. It starts tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Yeah. It is in room 105. It starts at nine o'clock, goes to three. It's just a great time for community as well as making quilts for the children's hospital. They have a potluck, people bring some food. So it's a good time. If you are interested in helping out with that, please come out. There uh, is information on our website and Jody Rogers leads that and you, her phone number's there. You can give her a call if you have more questions. And then also we have our you reach they have some very urgent needs here take a look happy sabbath church my name is israel peralta i work with you reach as the community outreach coordinator as we move forward we have needs with the shower trailer and one of the biggest needs that we have seen is for underwear 
and uh, we ask that you could please check out our Amazon wish list. You can see several different items, but we have also placed there underwear that you could buy in bulk. And it's gonna be very helpful as people come to shower, they can come out with new undergarments. Also, we wanna make a big request for more volunteers. We have several students on our wait list um, and we need more volunteers to come and help them either on a Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday. It's only for an hour and a half, you let us know what day works best for you. It's from 6 to 7.30 p.m. You can check out the volunteer application for Excel on our website, and you can also see the Amazon wish list on our Renew website. We continue to ask for your prayers. Thank you and happy Sabbath. And finally, it's hard to believe we're back to school already. In fact, next week is kind of the back to school bash and everything's going on. And Friday evening at 7.30 p.m., they're gonna have a sundown service. And then all four worship services, Sabbath morning, are gonna highlight the back to school. Just a reminder, the Anthem now has two services, one at 10 and 11.30. And so there's a lot going on and there's one more thing going on in the afternoon. There is. We're having the longest table, which originally started at Walla Walla College, so we need to give them a shout out yeah. for that. But we're going to try it down here, and I just want to say a huge thank you to the response that we have gotten for hosts. You guys have really um, given stepped back. Stepped up to the, the plate. Yes, and stepped up. So we actually have enough hosts now. So we just want to remind those of you who signed up to be a host that it will begin at 1.30. We'll get more details out to you. But again, this is just for university students and we are going to be partnering with the Campus Hill Church to provide over 50 tables for food for our students. And this is a time just to get to know them and just to be hospitable. Well, it's a great thing. We're working with yeah. the chaplain department yes, on campus. we are. And then Campus Hill Church and the Loma Linda University Church. So really trying to be a university church campus. Uh, that that loves experience. on our students. That's right. They need food to start the school year. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's our announcements for today. As always, for the latest information, go to our website, lluc.org. We sure do love you guys, and we hope that this Sabbath day is a blessing to each and every one of you. Have a great Sabbath.
Let's stand together as we sing our call to worship. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Oh, we can do a little better than that, I think. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Hey, I think they heard us all the way across town. Hey, Amen. It's truly good to be in the house of the Lord today. And it's truly good to see your beautiful and smiling faces today. We welcome each of you who are here in person, as well as those of you who are watching online, who may be at home in a hospital bed, in a nursing home, we want you to know that we are praying for you. David said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Someone say amen. amen. I imagine he said that if he had maybe a vegan macaroni and cheese or some vegan ice cream like I love, have mercy. Now, let me say, if you are in need of a spiritual and delicious spiritual blessing today, turn to your neighbor and say I need a spiritual meal today. And hey, you can get the other meal laid on out the church is over. Someone say amen. amen. Pastor Joey has prepared a sumptuous meal for us today, a sumptuous spiritual meal. And I know that it will bless your heart and your soul. And after you've eaten the meal, enjoyed it, digested it, be a good disciple of Jesus Christ and let someone else know how much you've enjoyed it and bless their souls as well so that they too can know just how good the Lord is. Welcome, welcome to worship. Let us stand for the hymn of praise.
Let us enter into the holy presence of our Lord and King on bended knee. O God, our Father, our holy King, and our friend, dear Lord, we come into your presence this morning and we seek your face. We seek your presence in our lives. Lord, Lord, not only in our hearts, but in this place as we commune together as disciples of yours. Dear Lord, may we make this church a center for discipleship. Lord, we ask that you will help us to train up the children that they might want to become disciples as they observe our lives. Dear Lord, may they want to worship you as they observe the actions of this church. Lord, we ask that you will bless them, and may they grow in discipleship. Dear Lord, be with the members of this church here in the sanctuary and abroad as they observe through online. Lord, may they sense your presence. May they know that we want you here in this community. And Lord, may we be the beacon that you have called us to be. As the new students of the new year come on campus, may they know that this church is where they can find Jesus Christ. Lord, as they go through their struggles, just as we do, may they seek your face in this place. There's so many among us, Lord, who have suffered loss. Dear Lord, my family has suffered loss. And I ask that you will come be near those who remain. I ask, Lord, that they may know that we have a great morning to look forward to, that we will be <clears throat> reunited with them, but Lord, best of all, be reunited with you. Thank you for what you have done here and what you are going to do. Lord, it's a dark world, and you sent your son to die for us, and people still rejected him. Lord, now you have sent us into this dark world. I ask, Lord, that we might reflect the character of Christ in kindness with a soft heart, receiving all who would seek you. Bless us in this endeavor, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. She went to the temple of Jerusalem alone. She was defined by what she didn't have. She didn't have a husband. She didn't have money. But for some reason, she found reasons to be thankful and to give. And she gave everything she had. She was so used to being unnoticed, unseen. She was not a prominent woman. But that day, Jesus was there, and he noticed her. Not only he saw her there, but he also saw her heart. He knew she was giving everything she had. Little this lady knew that for generations, her story will be told, because she gave with a cheerful, grateful heart. And I know that we say God loves us, God takes care of us, he's faithful. I know that as well. But today I would like to connect that truth, not only with my mind, but also with my emotions, with my heart, with my pocket, with my priorities, with the way I relate to people, because his sigh is on the sparrow. And he watches over us. He sees us. He notices us. He's faithful. So today and now, when the deacons collect the offerings and tithe, I, 
I pray that we can experience that. That connection with a God that cares, sees, and loves us so much. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. This is your special time, so come on up here. Now, you can come straight up here. You don't stop for Lamb's Offering today. We are going to be resuming Lamb's Offering October 8. So I think that all of our members there, make note of that. Tuck your dollars, 20s, maybe hundreds in there, and get ready for October 8. Have a seat. Sit down. Wow, there's so many boys and girls here today. I am happy to see you. Find a little seat. Well, today I want to ask you, do you remember what teacher Chris and teacher Scotty talked about for the last two weeks? This is a little quiz for you. Do you remember? They talked about myths. Do you remember what a myth is? Do you remember what a myth is? 
It's when we believe something that isn't necessarily true. We believe a lie, but we think it's real. I want you to look at my piece of paper here. I cut it out into a heart. When we open up our hearts, we allow Jesus to enter our hearts and make us wide and clean and fresh. But you know, Satan likes to tell us lies. Satan likes to make us think that we aren't worth very much. And Satan also likes us to think that no matter what we do, we're never going to be clean and fresh and new again. Have you ever felt that way before? Hmm. Well, this morning, I have a little something that I want you to take one and pass it along. There's one for everybody. It's a little piece of sandpaper. So go ahead, take it, pass it along. Mm-hmm. Does everybody have their sandpaper? Oh my, the lots of boys and girls this morning. I have lots of them. Preston, can I have you help the other boys and girls start handing a duga? Thank you. Okay, perfect. Does everybody have their sandpaper? Now I want you to take your sandpaper and I want you to rub it on your hand. Ouch. Does yours hurt? Does it hurt, Wyatt? Yes, it does. Paul, it, it's rough. And sandpaper, if I rubbed long enough, it would probably create a sore. In fact, it's painful. And you know what, boys and girls? Satan wants us to think that when we hear things like, I am not enough, uh, I don't want to forgive somebody, or I am a terrible, terrible person because I made a mistake and Jesus is not going to forgive me. It's like this sandpaper, rough, and it's painful, and it hurts, and it scares us, and it makes us sad. But you know, boys and girls, I want you to take now one of these. Take a piece of cotton, okay? Take a piece of cotton and pass it along. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your help. Does everybody have their cotton ball? Okay, come get your cotton ball. Now, what can we say a cotton ball feels like? What's the one word you can say? It's soft. Thank you. I heard that all around. It's fluffy. And when you go like this, what does it feel like on your hand? In fact, it's so soft, you could probably even put it on your face. And it doesn't hurt. You know, when I think of words and cotton, I think of words like, I forgive you. I am sorry. You know what? I didn't mean to say or do that, and I made a mistake. Those are words that open up our hearts and make us tender and loving towards others so that we, in turn, can accept Jesus' forgiveness. Satan wants us to think that all our, our feelings inside are crumpled and messy, but you know what? Jesus says, I forgive you. And he wants us to be compassionate, kind, and loving towards others. So this morning, Pastor Joey is going to talk about forgiveness. I think it's okay if you just take your little cotton ball and just rub your hand or your arm as you listen to what he has to say about forgiveness. Thank you for listening. You can go back to your seats now. Oh, thank you so much. I am going to invite the um, Del Sid family to come on up. Oh, 
the Del Cid family is dear to me. This is Michael and Nancy, Matthew and Jacob. And this family has been part of children's ministries for many years. In fact, they joined our soccer league. Nancy is a Sabbath school leader for Matthew's class. And she has just stepped up to leadership in our adventure club as well. So we love having them part of children's ministries. Michael works for the state of California as a parole agent. And Nancy also works for the state of California as a special investigator. And Matthew, can you share with everybody how old you are? Mommy. How old are you? Five. You're five years old. Yes, we Mommy. even practice that. Matthew is a very active five-year-old. And then we, of course, are here because of Jacob. Now, Jacob was born during the pandemic, and so he wasn't able to get dedicated earlier than this. Today is his second birthday. Happy birthday, Jacob. Yes, that's for you. <laughs> and so this is a special time. The family has lots of active things happening. Um, the kids are very involved in Sabbath school, love VBS, and we just love having them part of that. Now, Nancy, you sent me some of your desires and goals for your family, and I wanted to share that with you this morning. <laughs> One of our deepest desires has been for our boys to grow up in the SDA church and to learn about God's love. We pray that Jacob develops a relationship with God and walks with him for the rest of his life. Jacob loves to sing, dance, and play with his brother Matthew. He also enjoys playing and spending time with mama. He's a little bit of a mama's boy. <laughs> we ask that you pray for us as parents that we may be able to guide our boys in the right path and teach them the love of God. That's beautiful because as parents, we need to know that we have support and people come around us. So I know there is a group of people here who are here to physically support you, so I'm gonna invite you to stand at this time. How beautiful. I see your family. I see Sabbath school leaders. Thank you so much. Well, Jacob, you want to come over here? Let's see. You want to come over <laughs> here? We're going to pray for you, okay? Okay, yes, we're talking mama. Okay. <laughs> How about I just stand next to you? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless this precious family that has come before you this morning, Lord. They need your guidance. They need your wisdom as they raise these two beautiful boys. Thank you for Jacob and for the two years you've given him, Lord. And we ask you to bless his family and continue through every year of his life. Lord, we praise and thank you for the blessings that you have poured upon this family, the challenges that they have already faced, and the way that you are going to work with them in the future. Lord, thank you for the support that they have and for the friends and family that come alongside them. We ask you to bless them now today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
Before we continue with our sermon series, Myths, please read with me the following quotes. God rejoices, not because the problems of the world have been solved, not because all human pain and suffering have come to an end, nor because thousands of people have been converted and are now praising him for his goodness. No, God rejoices because one of his children, who was lost, has been found. Punishment is way easier than discipline. We think punishment is hard, and it is. But it's nowhere near as hard as actually walking out the process of getting your life cleaned up. I liken discipline to open heart surgery. It's a big operation with a long recovery period. I had to learn a whole new way to live, a whole new way to be me, and I had to be okay with that process taking as long as it took. But in that process, the things that were never addressed the first time, the shame, the guilt, and fear, finally got healed. Punishment only made those things grow in my life. It's not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciple of Christ to follow him. They behold the Savior's matchless love, revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth, from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross, and the sight of him attracts. It softens and subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholders, They hear his voice and they follow him. Now let's return to the service. Happy Sabbath, church family. Our scripture reading today is taken from Luke 19, verses 1 to 10, in the New International Version. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of all my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Comedian Steve Martin once said, before you criticize a man, walk a mile in his shoes. That way, when you do criticize him, you'll be a mile away and wearing his shoes. It's becoming easier in our society, easier than ever, to criticize people from a mile away. In February of 2020, uh, country music star Garth Brooks, any Garth Brooks fans in here? Anybody like Garth? Yeah, it's a few of you, tentatively raising your hand. Garth Brooks gave a concert in Detroit, Michigan. And he did it while wearing the, uh, the jersey of retired Uh, Detroit Lions running back, Barry Sanders. But when Garth posted this photo, this photo of himself backstage, it confused some of his uh, followers because they saw the name Sanders and the number 20, and they thought, they assumed that he was conveying support for Senator Bernie Sanders, who at that time was running for president. And as you can imagine, the backlash was immediate, and intense. One Twitter, Instagram user wrote, good grief, 
Can't you just do what you get paid to do? Why, why does it have to involve politics? Three exclamation points. So sad. We don't pay good money for anything other than to watch you perform. Thought you were different. Another wrote, weird that a millionaire would, be, would like a socialist. Hey, Garth, are you going to distribute your millions? Only on the internet, right? Now, before we judge these people too harshly, it's important for us to remember that we also can very easily slip into this kind of critical mindset. I mean, think back to this week. How many times did you see someone doing something you disagreed with, saying something you disagreed with, and had your mind immediately jump to criticism? Just as an experiment this week, I decided to keep track of how many times I did that. And let me tell you, the results were not pretty. I'm not going to give you the actual number because I don't want to tempt you to judge me. But it was high. It was a high number. I mean, I found myself criticizing clerks at the pharmacy for how they organize their aisles. You know, why would they put the adult Claritin in one aisle and the children's Claritin in a completely different aisle? I found myself judging people at, in line at, at Costco who, who, at Costco Gas who would wait until they got to the pump before they started fiddling around looking for their membership card. I mean, why, why, what were they doing in that 30 minutes they were waiting until they got there? And then, of course, I found myself criticizing drivers on the road, right? I mean, that's an easy one for cutting people off, for rolling through stop signs, right? It's called a stop sign, not a roll sign, right? I see some of you nodding in agreement. I see others of you judging me <laughs> for judging you. The truth is, we enjoy judging people. We do. We like criticizing people because it makes us feel good about ourselves. And yet, social media has created a venue, a forum, where we can publish our opinions, our criticisms, our judgments on everyone and everything everywhere. And it's created a culture where criticisms are louder than caring, where we are judged more by our failures than we are by our feats, and where it feels like some failures are so bad that they seem final, that there's no way out, that once we make that critical mistake, we, we wonder if there's any way to get out of it. So while we're judging other people, we are also secretly wondering if others are judging us. Like if they knew the private decisions that I made, would they reject me? Would they mock me? Would they cancel me? See, we're in the end of a series where we've examined the dangerous myths that shape our identity and drive our behaviors. And there is no more dangerous myth than this, that some failures are final. Because that's antithetical to the central message of Scripture and the opposite of what Jesus came here to do. So if failures aren't final, how can we ensure that our failures aren't final for us? To answer that question, we're going to turn to an, an encounter that Jesus had with a, a man who was told that his failures were final. It's found in Luke chapter 19, starting with verse 1. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up, turn them on, flip them over to Luke chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Now, this ac account occurs in the middle section of the book of Luke. See, Luke divides his gospel into three different major sections. The first section deals with Jesus' ministry in Galilee. The middle section deals with Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. And the third section deals with Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. So each of these sections are connected more thematically than they are, are chronologically. And so the theme of this middle section is that no one is outside of the reach of the Savior. No one is outside of the reach of the Savior. So in account after account, Luke describes how Jesus brings outsiders in. A bleeding woman, a blind beggar, a bunch of lepers. Those whom society had rejected, Jesus 
restores. But there is no, there is no outsider that the people love to hate more than Zacchaeus. Take a look, verse 2. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So there's three things, three facts that Luke wants his readers to understand about Zacchaeus. And the first was that he was a tax collector, which was very controversial back then. It's not like now where everybody loves to pay their taxes and can't wait for April 15th. No? No? Well, as much as we hate taxes now, they hated them even more because the Romans came and conquered the Jews and then forced the Jews to pay the Romans for the privilege of being a part of their empire. I mean, that would be like me coming into your home and charging you rent for the privilege of living in your own home. And the tax collectors were Jews who enforced Roman tax laws on other Jews. And the worst of all, they benefited from this betrayal. They, they could set the taxes as high as they wanted, and, and as long as the Romans got their cut, they didn't care. The tax collectors could keep the rest. So, so these tax collectors were despised by their communities. They were hated by their communities. They were on the same level as con men, cheats, Dallas Cowboys, you know? Everybody hated them. Nobody liked them. Amen? No amens? <laughs> you know, think, about, <laughs> think about how you feel when you think of a person like Harvey Weinstein, Bernie Madoff, people who take advantage of others for their own benefit. That's who these tax collectors were. And Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector, which means that he was the kingpin. So that's the first thing that Luke, the first fact that Luke wants us to understand about Zacchaeus was that he was the chief tax collector. And the second fact, the second fact was that he was rich, which means that he benefited a lot from his unsavory profession. He was very good at doing very bad things. That's how he became the chief tax collector. That's how he became rich. So if there was anyone who deserved to be canceled, if there was anyone who deserved to be rejected, if there was anyone who deserved to have his failures be final, it should have been Zacchaeus. But lucky for him, this is not the end of his story. There is one more fact that Luke wants us to understand about Zacchaeus. And this fact makes all the difference in the world for Jesus. Take a look, verse 3. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. You know, a lot of times we get sidetracked by Zacchaeus' height. Right? The fact that he was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. But that's not what Luke focuses on. What Luke wants us to understand is how desperately Zacchaeus wanted to meet the Savior. How desperately he was seeking the Savior. This is not some mild curiosity for him. He's not come for the show. He's come to encounter the Savior. He's not there out of curiosity. He wants to meet the Christ. And we know this because of how he behaves. He doesn't give up at the first sign of difficulty. You know, the, when the crowd pushes him aside, which they did. I mean, the way that this passage is written, it's clear that, that the crowd was intentionally getting in his way. And that is a theme throughout the book of Luke. The crowd often gets between the seeker and the Savior. Like when the demoniac clung to Jesus, the crowd pushes him away. When the bleeding woman tries to reach Jesus, the crowd forms a barrier. When the blind man tries to shout out to Jesus, the crowd tries to silence him. The crowd often gets between the seeker and the Savior. And I wonder, do we ever behave like the crowd? Do we ever get between the seeker and the Savior? 
by our words, by our actions, by our beliefs that some failures are final. Do we ever get between the seeker and the Savior? I wonder. But despite the crowd's best efforts, Zacchaeus will not be deterred. And so he, he casts aside his dignity and pride and runs, runs to that tree and climbs upon it, which is something that, that people, men and women in that culture just did not do. They did not run and they did not climb trees, which is why author Robert Stein in his commentary on this passage writes, such undignified behavior according to that culture indicates that more than curiosity was at play here. See, Zacchaeus wasn't there just for the show. He was there to encounter the Savior. That is the third fact that Luke wants us to understand about Zacchaeus. He was desperately seeking the Savior. And that fact made all the difference for Jesus. See, the crowd only cared about the first two facts. They only cared that Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector who had become rich by taking advantage of others. And they didn't care about anything else. They were so focused on his past mistakes that they didn't care about his present motivations. They were so blinded by the size of his sin that they didn't care that he was seeking the Savior. But Jesus did. That is the only fact that mattered to Jesus, that Zacchaeus was seeking him. So Zacchaeus' past couldn't prevent him from having a future with Jesus because no failure is final if we seek the Savior. Amen? No failure is final if we seek the Savior. And that's what we find in verse 5. When Jesus reached that spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. See, this is no chance encounter. Luke is very clear that Jesus intentionally comes here to meet Zacchaeus. He writes, I must stay at your house today. And the word that we translate must implies a divine necessity. It's a word that Luke uses over and over again in his gospel to show that this is a God-ordained appointment for Jesus, right? In Luke chapter 4, verse 43, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Luke chapter 9, verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things. Again, in that same verse, he must be killed and on the third day <clears throat> raised to life. These were divinely ordained appointments. So, meeting Zacchaeus on the road that day was just as much a part of God's plan for, Zac- for Jesus' life as him dying on the cross. Did you get that? Meeting Zacchaeus was as much of God's plan for Jesus' life as dying on the cross. I mean, think about that for a second. Zacchaeus has just gone through extreme measures to meet Jesus. I mean, he's He's, he's gone straight on stalker fan on Jesus, right? He, he climbed a tree. He hung from a bl- branch just to catch a glimpse of Jesus. I don't know if you've ever wanted to meet someone that badly before. I don't know. Maybe the Wedgwood Trio, right? <laughs> any, of you got, any of you go to that concert? That was amazing, weren't they? They were so funny. Maybe the Heritage Singers. The Heritage Singers Bear. No idea why the bear is so popular. I know. Randy Roberts, right? The closest thing that we have to an Adventist celebrity. (laughs) So imagine, imagine that you camped out, like you brought your sleeping bag the night before and slept right outside those lobby doors. So as soon as the the deacons opened them, you could come in here and have a great seat. And you sit through the service, listen to the message, and then when it's done, you fight through the crowds, get in line to shake the hand of Randy Roberts. And when you get there and you reach out to shake his hand, he gives you a big Randy Roberts smile as wide as Texas, right? And he calls you by name and hugs you and says, I've been waiting for you. Can't wait to go to your house for lunch today. 
How would that make you feel? I don't know about you, but my heart would break out in song, you know? <laughs> he knows my name, right? <laughs> See, what's amazing about this moment is that as hard as Zacchaeus fought to get to Jesus, Jesus fought even harder to get to Zacchaeus. Come on now. He didn't just come from Galilee. Jesus left the glories of heaven above. He cast aside his dignity and pride and ran, ran to earth and climbed upon that dying tree just to be with Zacchaeus. So if you forget everything else I say to you today, remember this. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what choices you've made, no failure is final because the Savior, He seeks for you. It doesn't matter if our families abandon us. It doesn't matter if our friends reject us. It doesn't matter if our communities cancel us. We have a Savior who will never stop loving us. The same Savior who fought through a storm and crossed a lake in order to free a demoniac, seeks for you. The same Savior who, who felt the touch of a bleeding woman through the press of the crowd, seeks for you. The same Savior who, who heard the cries of the blind man through the shouts of the crowd, seeks for you. The same Savior who came all the way from Galilee, to meet a tax collector hanging from a tree seeks for you. No failure is final because we have a Savior who never stops seeking for you. See, Jesus, he's a lot like GPS. Anybody here remember those times when we used to use paper maps to try to find out how to go somewhere that we had never gone before. Anybody? Anybody here still use paper maps? Yeah, there, there are some of you out there. Wow, that's incredible. So when I first moved to L.A., someone gifted me a Thomas Guide, which was just a big, thick book of maps with every road in Los Angeles, and they would have to keep reproducing this because, of course, they kept building roads, right? And whenever I wanted to go somewhere that I hadn't been before, which was a lot in L.A. because it was my first time living there, I would have to look up the address in the appendix of that book and find what page that corresponded with and find that page and then sort of reverse navigate myself to my starting point and then kind of memorize those directions because you can't keep flipping the map, right, while you're driving. And that was all before I even got in the car. It was so hard just to drive somewhere you, didn't, you hadn't been before. But then we got MapQuest. Anybody here remember MapQuest? Yeah, some more hands go up. Yeah, MapQuest. And MapQuest made things a lot easier because all you had to do was type in your address, the address you wanted to go through, and then you could print, like on paper, right? Print up a map with instructions on how to go there. The only problem was that if you ever got lost, right? You missed a turn, missed an exit, forget it. You might as well just go back home because there was no map for that. <laughs> but then we got GPS and all of a sudden it became so much easier to get where we wanted to go. Because we would just type in the address. You didn't even have to know what direction you were heading. I remember having to, is this north? Is this west? Is... You don't have to know any of that. You just type in the, uh, the address, and the GPS would give you step-by-step -step instructions of where to go. And now, we don't even need the address, right? You just say the name of the place you want to go, and then, and then Google Maps or Waze will find the, the, the address and get you there. And what's so amazing is that even when we get lost, even if we miss the turn, the GPS tries to get us back on track, right? Like if you miss a turn, what does, what does the GPS say? Rerouting, right? I can tell that some of you also don't listen to your GPS sometimes, yes. Rerouting, it says rerouting. And even if you miss that same turn over and over again, the GPS never gets frustrated. It just keeps on rerouting and keeps on rerouting because the GPS never stops seeking 
for you. It never stops trying to get you back on the right track. All you have to do is be willing to follow. Amen. And Jesus is a lot like GPS. He never stops seeking for us. He never stops trying to get us back on the right track. All we have to do is be willing to follow. Willing to allow God to reroute our lives. See, that, that is what repentance is. It's just a fancy word for God rerouting our lives. Literally, re repentance is a change of direction. It means we were going one way and we turned around and allowed God to take us a different way. So how then can we repent? Because that's a good question because sometimes there's been a little bit of confusion on what it takes to repent. See, a lot of, a lot of times people think of repentance as confession followed by punishment, right? We say that we're sorry for something and then someone meets out an appropriate amount of uh, punishment for us and then we move on. Because that's what we do in our judicial system, right? We, someone confesses to a crime and then a judge tells them what their punishment will be, and then everybody moves on. But that is not what biblical repentance is. Repentance is not about retribution. It's about restoration. Can you say that again? Repentance is not about retribution. It's not about making sure that the offender suffers the same amount of pain that they cost. It's not about retribution. It's about restoration. It's about God allowing God to repair our lives so that we can be better. So how do we do that? How do we repent in a way that we can be better, that it allows God to reroute our lives? Well, we start by doing what Zacchaeus did. Zacchaeus started by acknowledging what he had done wrong. Zacchaeus acknowledged what he had done wrong. See, the reason why he went searching for Jesus was that he recognized that he had made a mistake, that he had made a lot of mistakes, that he had made choices that took him off God's path for his life. He recognized what he had done wrong. And if we also want God to be able to reroute our lives, if we want to be better, we have to start by recognizing what we've done wrong. We have to ask ourselves, who has been hurt by our choices? How have we hurt ourselves? How have we hurt others? How have we hurt God? How have we added to the brokenness of this world? Recognize what we've done wrong. And that's not easy. That kind of admission is actually very painful, which is why a lot of people avoid it. So instead, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll minimize what we've done rather than maximize our admission. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the man who cheated on his taxes. He was starting to feel so guilty about what he did. He couldn't sleep at night. So he decided to write a letter. He wrote a letter to the IRS saying, I cheated on my taxes. I put the wrong numbers down. I can't sleep at night. So here's a check for $1,500. And then he added at the end, if I still can't sleep at night, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> now we laugh, but that's exactly what we do, right? We minimize, we minimize what we've done instead of maximizing our admission because it's painful. But it is the only way for God to begin to reroute our lives. It's the only way to be better is to make a full confession and ask for forgiveness. So that's the first step in this repentance process, is to recognize what we've done wrong. And the second is to realize why we've done wrong. See, after we've recognized what we've done wrong, it's important for us to realize why. This process of repentance begins, it begins with confession, but it continues through self-examination, which is why in Psalm chapter 139, the psalmist writes, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, the outward sins that we commit are a result of an inward brokenness. 
I love how Dr. George Knight describes this in his book, I Used to Be Perfect. Eve <clears throat> committed sin, in capital letters, when she loved herself and her desire more than she loved God and his will. She committed sin in her heart. And that sin in her heart led to the taking and eating of the fruit. Sin in the heart leads to sins in terms of actions. Something happens in the heart first. First, there is sin in the heart. That sin in the heart then gives birth to sinful actions. Thus, sin leads to sin. Notice that Dr. Knight associates sin with love. Because sin at its core is a misplaced love. It's loving something or someone more than we love God. So when we commit sin, sinful actions, at its root is a love for something. Wealth, power, belonging, acceptance, pleasure, comfort. These are not bad things. But sometimes we love them more than we love God. We love them so much that we're willing to sin in order to get them. So what is the sin that drives, what is the love that drives our sin? What is the desire that drives our behavior? See, all of us are warped in different ways inside. So some of us may lie because we want to belong. We want people to accept us, so we lie. Others of us lie because we, we want to manipulate or control others. We don't trust them, so we lie. The outward action is the same, but the inward desire is different. So if we want, to, we want God to reroute our lives, if we want to be better, we have to, we have to ask ourselves, why? We have to realize why we sin. Why do we do wrong? So that's the second step. We start by recognizing what we've done wrong. Then we move to realizing why we've done wrong. And then we move, finally, to the how. How do we begin to repair the damage we've caused? See, the amazing thing about God is that He doesn't take away our agency. And what I mean by that is... We don't have to be parents for very long before we realize that we can't do everything for our children, right? That actually, by trying to do everything for our children, we stunt their growth. So even if we can do something better as their parents, we allow our children to do it so that they can learn and they can grow. In psychological circles, they refer to this as giving a sense of agency or a sense of control. And God, like a great parent, does not take away our agency. That's why he invites us to partner with him in, in repairing some of the messes that we've made. I mean, notice in this story, in this encounter, Zac the process of repentance begins for Zacchaeus when he recognizes what he's done wrong. But it isn't until he begins to repair some of his messes that Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Take a look, verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So he promises to try to repair some of the mess he's made. And that's when Jesus says to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. And then I love how this passage ends. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. See, that's why Jesus came. That's why the Savior came, to seek sinners. Amen. Friends, this process of repentance will not be easy. It's going to take fight. It's going to take us casting aside our dignity and pride. It may even take us climbing some trees to get there. But it is the only way. It's the only way for God to reroute our lives. It's the only way to be better. And the good news is we're not in this process alone. As hard as we're fighting to be with Jesus, Jesus is fighting even harder to be with us. 
So begin this process of repentance. Recognize what? Realize why? And then begin to think through how to repair some of the mess we've made. And we'll discover that no failure is ever final because we have a Savior who will never stop seeking for us. shadows come and why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is Constant friend is he, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye. And I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches. Will you sing that with me again? I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know, and I know watches you and me his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches and I know he watches oh and I know good and gracious God, our God who watches over us more than a hundred thousand sparrows. We want to thank you for being a Savior who constantly seeks, who never stops seeking for us. Help us to never stop seeking for you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. 
Amen.
well, another week. Whether it's been a good one or not so good, it's greeting time and Sabbath, so everything is lots better. Hello, Betty Roberts, Keene, Texas. 94th birthday, I think, and we're so glad that you're a part of our family via our senior pastor, your son, Randy. Congratulations on your birthday, and God bless you, Mother Roberts. Hello, Dean and Tammy Sandow, Scapoos, Oregon. 45th anniversary, I understand. So glad to be reminded of you folks and send you warm congratulations. Hello, Nicole Mikoff, New York City. Congratulations on your birthday. And so glad to see you there with Mother Narcissa and your dad, Paul. A big hello to you, Scott Reed. Welcome to the Southland. Glad to be reminded of your ministry. See you there with wife Holly and then your sons. Hello, Kara Johnson. Pastor Johnson, Portland, Oregon, a part of the Oregon Conference. And congratulations on your new assignment. And we're glad to see you there with husband Terry. Hello, Clifford Goldstein. We mainly know you in print and glad to see you in life. And obviously, you are a very happy grandpa. Congratulations on your birthday, Clifford. Wally and Carol Hasselbrack, Calhoun, Georgia. We remember you from a while back, and I think it's your 50th anniversary. Warmest congratulations and glad to see you there when Jenny came home on a vacation. Cheryl Lake, we're so proud of you and your work in the Loma Linda University Church Media Office and glad to be reminded of that happy day when you were mother of the bride. Hello, Brad Brown, Paradise, California. Congratulations on your birthday. Glad to see you there with wife, Karen, and then with your son and your daughter. Doris Cummings, 97th birthday, Doris. Glad to see you there with granddaughter, Gina Yavor, and your late husband, Ken, brings back wonderful memories and more of your family. Hello, Lillian Keys, Phoenix, Arizona. So glad to be in touch with you whenever and wish you happy birthday. And most of us think of you as the first lady of the Arizona Conference with Pastor Ed. Dennis and Pauline Park, dear, dear friends, 56th anniversary, I think. Congratulations and always glad to be in touch with you. Hello, Leonard Wheeler. Amargosa Valley, Nevada. You remind me of 1951 Laurelwood Academy. We were there at the same time. Happy birthday, Leonard. Marilyn and Calvin Thompson are marking their 51st anniversary. Congratulations, you two. There you were, and there you are on an occasion when you were with Julie. Christopher Thomas, part of our church here in Loma Linda, Congratulations on your birthday. And glad to see you there with wife Claudia on your visit to the Golden Gate. Hi, Doug Mace. Wow, we couldn't do without you. And so we congratulate you on another birthday and so happy to see you there with dear Susie. Hello, Sharon Jelinski. Congratulations on another birthday and see you there with Marlon. And what a happy grandma. Miklin Lipang, someplace in Europe about now, and we're glad to have you home whenever we can, and that's certainly true of your mom and your dad and the three of you together. Hello, Richard Tompkins. Clear back to Walla Walla College days. I know because we were there together, and congratulations, Richard, on another birthday. Steve Arrington, Paradise, California, while wow, your ministry inspires so many people, and I'm glad to be reminded of your birthday and to get to see you there with wife Cindy. David Snyder, Milwaukee, Oregon, 87th birthday. I know about those birthdays, David. And we go back to Oregon Conference days. Glad to see you there with wife Rini and daughter Nancy. And Jay and Romia Sagala, a part of our Loma Linda University Church, Congratulations on your anniversary. There you were, and there you are. 
Kaifus and Katerina Toma, Rio Claro, Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, marking your 14th anniversary. Congratulations, you two. Thank you for being with us on our church services week by week. And I'm delighted to introduce you to the Walters family. There is Fenwick, who's marking a birthday right about now, and his wife and granddaughter, his wife Colleen, and his granddaughter Sophia, and then their daughter Natleen recently had a birthday as well. Congratulations all. Yes, one more week, and I pray that all of you will keep looking up and going forward in faith.